uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to our new members and new members and our pending new members. If we can, if you don't mind just taking a minute and let's go around the room and just say hello, your name and um, I don't know, your favorite ice cream flavor. <laughs> so I'm Suzanne Cameron. I'm the one of the co-chairs of the Affordable Housing Trust and I love grape nuts. <laughs> I'm Madeline Nash. I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Housing Trust. I'm very excited to have some new faces here. Um, I think that I would have to say that mocha fudge is my favorite. Nice. But I like the yogurt, not the full fat, because I'm always thinking about that, because I'm just like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, John, do you want to talk about your favorite ice cream flavor? Sure, John Fian from the YWCA Greater Newburyport. Um, and pretty much whatever ice cream you put in front of me, that's my favorite flavor. There you go. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, John. Who's that? Robert, you're next on my in my row. Hi, I'm Robert Courier. I'm the newest member of the Affordable Housing Trust. And my, <laughs> my favorite ice cream is frozen pudding. Oh, so, one of the one of the great flavors that there is. I'm very happy when I have that. Excellent, yummy, Brian. You're you're on mute. You're on mute, Brian. Oops, sorry. Oh. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm a new member of the Housing Trust as well, and um, I'll go for Heath Bar Coffee. Ooh. at Haji's. Oh, mm. your, your neighbors, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, Tiffany, thanks for joining. Hi, everyone. I vote for coffee, cookies, and cream. <laughs> Great. Yum. Excellent. Thank you. Marianne, thanks for joining. Is that for me? That's for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so my favorite is uh, Kahlua chip yogurt. Sweet. Yum. That sounds great. Thank you. Karen, welcome. I want to know where you get that Kahlua chip yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> really? Seriously? Hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? I apologize. I came on a minute late. You introduce yourself and your favorite ice cream. Oh, my name's Karen Wiener, and I'm uh, on the Affordable Housing Trust, and my favorite ice cream is going to be Kahlua chip yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we're all getting along already. I love this. And last but not least, uh, Mio, I see, I don't see you, but I see your name. Are you still there? Did she drop? I think we lost her. Well, also, I want to hear what Caitlin's favorite flavor is. Oh, Caitlin, yes. Oh. I was going to say, yeah, Caitlin for last. Oh, there's but there's Mio. Let, Mio, are you there? All right. Well, we're waiting for her. Let's go with Caitlin. Okay. Hi, Caitlin Sullivan, Office of Planning and Development. Um, and I knew immediately what I was going to say. Anything with rainbow <laughs> sprinkles because oh. my <laughs> two and five-year-old insist on that on everything. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. And Mio, if you're able to... So Mia was just recommended um, as the, uh, the next newest housing trust member at committee. So she'll be going to full, full uh, council uh, at the next meeting. Hey, Mio. I think we're, you're having trouble with audio. Hi. Hi. I'm, I have some problems connecting in. I'm having, oh. I'm having some problems, so it keeps pushing me out back in so I've stopped the video I hope that helps okay well welcome do you have a favorite ice cream flavor <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, yes I like um I guess just vanilla oh <laughs> good it's, it's the base <laughs> for everything right so that's good um well thank you Dude, okay can do a lot. Good. Thank you all. Thank you so much for that. That's always, I always like hearing um, interesting factoids about people. 
Okay, so we're here today to talk about uh, the uh, re, um, reset of the rental assistance program. And um, we, as most of you know, um, we've had a very successful emergency rental assistance program that was tied to COVID. And so we have a new allocation of funds and we would like to build our develop based a lot on basically what we know already about the emergency rental assistance program, um, a, a, a program that will live infinitum in, in our portfolio. So folks who have issues that are not related to COVID happen all the time. And we wanna make sure that we can keep people housed and, um, and safe in their homes. So tonight's, um, workshop is really to talk through what that might look like, what the needs are, our community partners, please. Uh, we, we want you to push on us to, because you know the needs of your tenants and your, your housing. And so your, your, um, your feedback is going to be crucial. Um, so we'll go through that. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the existing housing rehab program that's used for preservation and modifications primarily for uh, to bring homes um, up to code for low and moderate income uh, home buyers. So we would like to think about how we, and so far we have not had any takers um, utilize that program, any homeowners utilize that program. So we wanna talk about how we might modify that a little bit to incent folks to take advantage of the grant because it's a grant. Um, we'd also like to add um, um, energy efficiency attributes to the description of uses. So, you know, weatherization and insulation and things like that, that will help maintain, you know, lower uh, fuel, and fuel costs for the homeowner as well. And that's it. And so um, any questions so far before we jump in? Okay. And um, any, so this is a conversation, don't, you know, if you want to jump in, jump in, um, you're absolutely welcome to, I don't want to hog the conversation. Um, so if, um, Caitlin, are you able to share screen with the, um, the, the current description of our emergency rental assistance program? I am. So let's Great. see, here we are. Wonderful. So this was what we um, said, the emergency rental assistance program guidelines. And so perhaps we can, we can pull these up and kind of talk about how this new program might differ from this, but this is a good base, I think, to work off of. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to review the eligibility? Okay. Um, so any, um, any, let's just, you know, any um, observations about, first, let me, let me back up. So from Tiffany and John, what are you hearing as in terms of the needs of folks who are falling behind on rent outside of the COVID situation, just in, in the current situation or even before COVID? Like what, what, are, what, what do you think is an important aspect of emergency rental assistance? So they're beyond like the medical needs because of COVID, um, like acute medical or mental health, which someone is temporarily out of work um, while they're, um, you, you know, kind of rehabbing and getting support services. Um, it could be rising housing costs are a huge um, issue right now. And you know some of landlords that are um, selling. Um, sometimes it's, you know, something happens in a family's life, and they, you know, I'm thinking of they lost a voucher for daycare, and you know, there's a temporary um, shut off, and and trying to get that back in place. So um, you know the. The, they don't have daycare, they can't get back to work. So sometimes it becomes a, an issue in a cycle of um, get, getting restabilized. Thank you. Um, how about if you can, 
are there programs for utilities and arrearages there? Or is that, could that potentially be something we could utilize this funding for? So what do you mean is it? Are there other sources of funds that would help with utilities to, to bring folks up to date if they're in arrears? So like do our, um, yeah, any program. I'm just like, are there oh, other resources? I don't. Yeah. yeah. So um, specifically in New Report, there's like Howard Benevolent, the New, New Report Charitable, um, St. Vincent de Paul, Salvation Army. Um, okay. Yeah, oh, and, okay. and sometimes funding specific, um, depending on the grant itself, um, the amount specific. And, and don't forget lie heap, uh, which oh, is the, uh, the community the action. Yeah. Thanks, John. And, and that should always be the starting point for um, any kind of utility arrearages. Okay, good. So I they're just... not helping with electric though, unless it's heat. They're okay. only helping with heating sources. They used to help a few years ago, but um, but they came to present and and notified us that it would just be for heating. So at this point too, we're, we're people that, um, cause there's been some mass shutoffs of electric, um, we're helping apply for raft funds for that as well. Because they're having to come up with a large amount to turn back on, which is 20% of their total arrears, which sometimes can be hundreds and hundreds of dollars, so. Thank you. John, do you have any other additions? Well, you know, pre-COVID, I, I think what we saw with our tenants that struggle with um, paying rent is just their income is so low or they have a job that's, that, you know, a couple of them are self-employed and depending on what their able to generate for income, you know, determines whether or not they're able to pay rent. And that's a chronic problem. I mean, it just, you know, it, it, it there's no easy solution to that. Um, and then more recently, what we've seen among staff is that staff that have lived in apartments uh, for, you know, over a decade at a fairly stable rent, now are suddenly being evicted or told that the rent is quadrupling. You know, I mean, it is, there's no um, gradu you know, gradual increase, you know, so you go from 1300 a month to, you know, 2800 a month um, or, or more, you know, and, and so uh, staff that are in that position are just having to leave, leave Newburyport. Mm -hmm. You know, they're good. They, 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 they know that, that making that jump is, is a, you know, they're never going to be able to do it. It's not sustainable. Yep. And another thing too is transportation is a big barrier um, of having reliable transportation if they can get to their job. Um, sometimes if they are taking public transportation and then there's a child involved. So it's, it's really kind of putting all the pieces together um, for that sustainability. There's a lot of barriers, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 No, I'm just, you know, just for the benefit of everyone, um, it's as we shape this program, we want to make sure that we're including the eligibility that um, is a is sort of an ongoing uh, chronic issue. Now, uh, don't forget, we have a cap. Right, so the the um, the COVID program is capped at forty five hundred dollars in total, or fifteen hundred dollars per month. Is that correct, Caitlin? Yes, yeah. that is yes. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, great. Um, and and so that so because we know that COVID, well, hoping that COVID flies away at some point um we had you know we 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 did that as sort of a temporary um fix because of the nature of the emergency assistance 
So I guess we, you know, I'm putting that out there too. I'm just putting this out. So do we want to continue to cap? Um, do we want to raise the cap? Um, and, and these are just questions not meant to be answered right now. Yeah, I guess the one way to phrase the question is, um, you know, are there ways that the emergency assistance program didn't meet the need? Like, were there folks that weren't eligible for some reason, or they needed more assistance, or, you know, was, were there some barriers within the program that we set up that we could modify? Um, there, because of the amount of um, the rental um, in new reports, some were higher than 1500. Um, so it was looking at what, what they could afford. And there was definitely some other funding that we provided from other grants. Um, but situations may be different as people are getting back to work. Um, but it, it really all depends. It, it's a case by case situation, I think, just based on the rental amount, because they really were um, different from household to household. It wasn't like 2,500 was kind of the average. There were some that were fairly reasonable rents, um, and then some that were, you know, sort of like almost like a mortgage payment of um, 3,200. Um, so, if, because the cap would be like a general cap across the board that was available to, to all households. That's the way it's structured now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think the trick to me is what is sustainable. Like I, right. you know, when there's an emergency, like like John, you said somebody's rent goes from 1,300 to 2,800, us helping them for two months isn't gonna change anything. They can't, presumably on they have the same salary, they can't afford that. Um, you know, so I want to make sure the dollars go where it's a temporary kind of situation that that covers the gap and then people can continue, you know, to pay. And Karen, that's that's what we look at too, right? Because we just we don't want to be providing money when we could be if they were able to afford something um, at a lower amount, putting our money towards that more affordable rent versus where they are, that is not sustainable. So not we are looking at the at the full picture. Yeah. Um, unless we know, right, that um, they're getting a second job or their hours are going to increase right. and we can verify that. Um, if there was a temporary um, child support got shut off, but that's going to be reinstated. Again, we're looking at the full picture. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I know you guys do that. And I, I think we're really lucky to have you you know, doing this program, implementing the program for us. I just, um, I'm just sort of making the point that I wanna make sure that that's what the dollars are used for. Exactly what you're saying, Tiffany. And, and I'm sorry to, to not know the answer to this, but do you allow the funds to be used for um, security deposit and first and last month's rent? Um, so that is on, I was just gonna say that, thank you, um, that that is also on the table um, to provide um, sort of that, that those, that steep climb into rental housing in the first place and to help with, you know, either first or last, um, or security, one of those things. And, and, and we're seeing too, I don't know if it's starting here, but we're starting to see broker fees, which is another, um, expense, um, because it really is a, it is, um, it is paid by the renter typically, um, at least in Boston it is, and I'm starting to see it pop up here. Maybe Brian- Yeah, I see it up here as well okay. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so that's- you're talking a lot of money, first, last, security, and a broker. And a broker, right. Sometimes one month, right? Like it's, yeah, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Not to mention moving expenses. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I think we're trying to look at two things that are, are interconnected. One is, you know, our- existing emergency assistance program that we created under COVID, you know, we feel like it did make an impact. And, and yet, so we're asking tonight, you know, are there ways in which it could be tweaked? Should it be continued? 
now that we think COVID is lessening its impact? Um, or should we continue it to some degree? So that's sort of the first question. And the second question, which is related, is should we be creating a program similar to the emergency assistance program, but that is designed more about helping people move into Newburyport or stay in Newburyport. It's sort of this first and last month's rent question. Uh, and that's what we had um, submitted a application to the CPC for. Um, you know, and, and part of why we started thinking about a program that is a little different from the emergency or rental assistance program was that we were thinking about the um, Newburyport crossing units coming online, the Minko property. And we were aware that um, at 80% AMI as the rent, as the income limit, those rents are pretty high uh, with the fair market rents set by, you know, a regional basis. So we were, we were thinking, gosh, those are affordable units, but they're expensive and it's gonna be hard for people to afford putting together first, last and security. What can we do to sort of help make those affordable units more accessible to people? And then we started thinking, well, do we really wanna limit it to income restricted units? That's a question. And, and we had a meeting with Mr. Minicucci from Minco and he sort of led us to think that you know, he doesn't always require first, last and security of all of his new tenants and that he kind of worked with people, um, which was a little puzzling, but um, it made us think, you know, maybe we don't have to focus on first, last and security at income restricted units. So that's sort of a little bit of a background, but, um, you know, it's very helpful to get any kind of feedback from you guys in this discussion. Um, but in my mind, what I'm thinking of is building off of the emergency assistance program, which we feel was effective, and sort of taking it to this new level of something that might be more long term, but also is still responsive to emergency needs. <laughs> if that makes sense. Can it be, uh, can we utilize it the same, uh, these, the, funding for both of those things. So it, like, for example, um, as Tiffany was saying, you know, temporary, temporary loss of job due to medical or loss of, you know, whatever, we can create that eligibility. That's not necessarily, it's not tied to COVID, but people lose their jobs all the time or have medical issues or a loss of hours to get to John's, you know, like underemployment, temporary underemployment, loss of, uh, you know, child or due to loss of child support and they have to fill the gap for a little while. And these are what I, and I'm saying temporary because I think we need to focus on temporary assistance just to help keep folks afloat and house while, until they get on their feet, right? So, um, um, but um, I guess my question is, and that would be, I think, pretty clear. Those eligibility requirements could be, you know, sort of tailored off of what we've already done. But can we also add um, grants also available for, um, you know, this, you know, move uh, first, last security, whatever you want to call it, broker fee. Um, and I and I do think that we need to do this based on income eligibility and not tied to affordable units because folks are renting market rate units as well or small a affordable right so um anyway i'll leave that there i'm just asking the question i guess that's for caitlin can we bifurcate the use of of this of this money yep so the cpa grant that you all applied for this year was reimbursement for the emergency rental assistance program and then new funds for i guess a general rental assistance program with the parameters and guidelines you know to be sorted out by the trust so um it was pretty open-ended so i think okay. um this makes a lot of sense i think what you're saying yeah you're identifying you know a temporary you know for Pengill when they you know get someone in there to, to identify you know is there like a temporary barrier that someone is experiencing um maybe a good way to piggyback on the program you have now yeah 
Uh, Suzanne, first of all, I, I would say in terms of um, security deposit to make that available to any low income person and not do it to just uh, affordable house, you know, those that are restricted yeah. as affordable housing. Yeah. But the, the, the other question that you need to answer, and, and we struggled with this at the YWCA, is when you've got those funds, do you require that the funds come back to the trust when the person moves? Yeah, um, I, so I, yeah, St. Vincent de Paul does that. It's pain in the ass as a landlord. Um, and then the person has no money to then to move on to the next um, to the next project or to the next housing. But on the other hand, then it keeps your fund so that you can use it theoretically to serve more people. So it's it's I don't have an answer for you. I just have the question. Yeah, I you know just and you guys all weigh in. I I I don't see it coming back. I think whether we use it for first or last or security or what have you, it's out the door. Um, I don't think we expect that to to come back in any way. Um, but I'll I'll open that up. I I agree with that, and partly what I I liked one of the models of the thing Caitlin sent around, or maybe it was Donna's email. I think it was in Malden or Medford. You know, it's almost like a lump move in some for what people need and pet and guild sort of help figure that out so if it's security if it's first months maybe some place isn't asking for last months but there's a broker's fee or maybe the move moving truck is you know really an issue or, or whatever it is that maybe it'd be a lump sum that kind of go i mean i i think probably it should still go directly to the landlord or the moving company um you know just to keep all that just keep in terms of administering it but Security deposits make me a little nervous, especially with messing around with, do they get them back? And then do we get a portion or, you know, I, I don't think we should do that. I think it should be a grant, outright grant. Mm -hmm. And um, for whatever they need, I mean, it's different from the emergency program. It's more, uh, um, Tiffany, you said, now I'm forgetting what you said, or Caitlin, um, barriers to moving in or something like that program. Mm -hmm. Karen, um, I don't feel like I saw anything about moving expenses but yeah, you know one, it was five thousand dollars i it was malden or medford it was like yeah a lump it's, it's sum. it was a lump sum because i i thought and and you know again all of this is open to consideration but i thought malden would allow up to five thousand um and they want to see a one-year lease mm, and it would be for first good. and last month's rent up to five thousand and it was also sort of interesting to me that they have some priorities like, um, uh, or maybe this was Chatham, <laughs> that um, you know, there's a priority for Chatham residents. No, I think that's Malden. Malden has a priority for Malden residents. Um, Living in Malden, moving to some other property in Malden, right? Right, right. right. And then Chatham had a priority for um, households with students in the school system or town employees. Um, again, that's just, you know, a little layer of consideration. But it, I guess I'm wondering whether it, it might be best to start, you know, and this can be changed over time, but best to start with it being limited to first and last. And, you know, if you provide first and last, then they have more money for the moving truck. You know, um, it just, it seems like maybe it would keep it simpler somehow. You know what, I, I need to um, uh, apologize. I just looked it up. I just read it wrong. It, it said the model program will pay moving costs, including first and last month's rent. And somehow I read that as moving costs. Um, so oh, I'm fine yeah, with yeah. that. Yeah, I'm yeah, fine yeah. with it being directly the landlord and being yeah. being first and last. The security deposit I get a little worried about, but maybe if we just say it's, you know, it goes back to them if they, you know, if all goes well and the security deposit's returned at the end, it just goes to them and not to us. Yeah, but the secure, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I mean, I'm yeah. open to consideration. I personally feel like first and last would make a big difference and and, you know, maybe not go for the security deposit. You know, and a lot of landlords are waiving security deposits now because it's just oh, too much really? liability. It's got to be in this escrow account. If it's not 100%, you yeah, can get three times right. damages. So a lot are just doing first and last. Mm -hmm. And there's enough brokers like myself. I would help somebody without taking a fee. Um, I do that all the time. Oh, I hate I, it. I, I... Question. 
um, Minco just completely so released. The ladies, did they drop? Uh, I'm sorry. sorry, Mary, you're, you're in, I mean, Mio, you're in and out. And, and Robert's talking. And, yeah, I'm having problems. And sorry. I was just going to say one of those towns actually uh, noted that it was very hard um, to administrate the security. Right. Yep. Yep. So there is another question. On the uh, Robert Thank you. speaking. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> Mingo has just completely filled the building um, down on Parker Street. And he has 19 affordable units in there. What percentage of those 19 needed any type of financial assistance for them to move in? Do you know what that number is? That's a good we, question, Robert. This is Caitlin. I know that there's been you know, no assistance provided by the trust to move in. And it didn't seem like there was any, um, you know, when Lou came in and spoke to us. Okay, so we, so he, you, the city of Newburyport did not give any assistance to those 19 people. That's right. Okay, the next building he's doing is 21. He has 40 people on a list to move into those affordable units already. So can one assume that they won't need help either? And if that's true, his next building is 24 units. He's applying to do that on, on Route 166 Route 1. Then he's got two more buildings beyond that for a total of 106 affordable units he will be providing in the next couple of years. So he's the big guy in town providing affordable units. And I think if, if he is willing to work with us and to help some of these people, we can really stretch the money that we have to other people besides the ones that are the affordableness going into his building. So I, I think it's he's being very nice. Well, I, I think it's an interesting um, question. I, I think it would be helpful for us to reach out to Minco and find out you know, how they feel the rent up has gone and the folks on their waiting lists um, and to see whether they encountered um, barriers to people moving in because of inability to provide first and last month's rent. And again, you know, as I said a little while ago, our impression after the one meeting that we, a meeting we had with Mr. Minicucci about a year ago, the sense he left me with was that this was not a problem for him. And, no. But it was it was a little confusing because I was not clear on what his firm policy was. <laughs> Seemed like he kind of works with people, um, which you know maybe is good, but makes me a little nervous. Like, does he treat everybody the same? I I, I just don't, I'm not saying he doesn't. I just was a little confused. Um, I, I think what you're when you're talking about uh, tenants at the eighty percent AMI level. Um, we're not, those aren't the same issues that we're having below 80%, right? 60% or 50%. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think, I mean, if I recall, and I don't have the report in front of me, but the, um, the COVID assistance, so we were talking about, you know, I, I can't remember the AMIs, but nobody came close to 80%, even though that was their cap. Tiffany, is that correct? Yeah. There was four households that um, were at eighty percent. Okay. All right. And then, oh, actually, I'm recalling now. I'm sorry. I the Minko properties are are um, there are set asides for different income levels, right? I think they're all 80% AMI. They're yep, all 80. So the, okay. Yep. So the Minko projects are all 25% affordability in each of the, you know, the three buildings. Um, and then they're all, you know, there's a, a various numbers, you know, studios, one bedroom, two, three, all 80%. AMI. All 80%. Okay. I think I, we, I think we started the conversation. We were going to ask right. for some deeper, some deeper uh, rental subsidies there. Right. For, That's a consideration yeah. for the future. That's, right. 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 But okay. my, my point. I, I'm my just point wondering. Is, 
Yeah, I'm just wondering if we could negotiate with Minko that if we do provide assistance, then um, they, he could drop some of the um, requirements, just have an agreement with us, because it sounds like when he deals with certain people, he's okay with that. You know, it, maybe if we had an ongoing agreement with him. I just like, and, and yeah, I, I think that this, uh, this warrants more investigation, but I also think that Minko has their formula down pat. They're charging market rate rents. They're covering any losses. They, they're, 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 they've got it worked out, right? This is yeah. different than a small landlord situation. Very different where you have a variety of, of, um, units, you know, a variety of attribute, tenant attributes, et cetera. Um, I, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, I mean, this assistance in my mind would be available to anybody who's income eligible. It doesn't matter where, right. but I don't think, you know, we need to, whatever. I don't know. I, I want us to kind of think more broadly. And even though he is probably, um, you know, the, the, the big A <laughs> champion of in, in Newburyport, we've got all this little A out there that's going to need some help. So that, I mean, it, it, and I don't, I don't want to argue it, or, you know, we can argue that point, that's fine. Um, but I, I do think he's got it down, which is why he doesn't seem phased by, you know, collecting uh, whatever he collects at, at time of uh, lease. So um, I think he would tell us if he needed it. But if a tenant there in any of those properties happened to be in need, if they lost a job or they lost hours or et cetera, et cetera any of these other attributes, they're certainly welcome to come and apply for funding. Right. Agreed. Well, it seems like people are, are, are kind of interested and excited about the idea of a program that would provide first, last, and, uh, first and last <laughs> month's rent uh, to folks with an income limit of up to 80% AMI. And, and, and then we might want to do something like have a cap, like they have in Malden, of up to $5,000. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to. We have to be able to stretch the money. And like you said, it has to be temporary, temporary, temporary. Like we, the expectation is this is helping folks out of a bind, right? And they're... Um, well, and that it's, uh, how is it sustainable? So, you know, it has right. to be a one-year lease that someone, I mean, I like the idea of it being a one-year lease. One of the programs did that. So the landlord showing that commitment too. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, and it's it possible, a, I'm sorry, go uh, ahead. It, I was going to say it's possible we limit it to once. I mean, I don't know whether we want to do that, but, you know, would we be okay with every 12 months assisting a family that moves from one apartment to another? I mean, maybe we don't have to decide that now, but it's just something to think about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is Caitlin. This is sounding to me a lot like the program we have now, just kind of adding in more ways for people to be eligible. Yeah. You know, whether it's, you know, the barrier to move in, which is the first and secure, first and last month's rent, or there's some kind of temporary barrier they're experiencing. So, you know, it sounds like, basically this same program just expanded this exactly I'm hearing. yep yeah. and and yeah. would we want to um be confident that they had you know used what other resources are available to them like is is raft is it even called raft anymore is it something else i'm looking at karen <laughs> so raft <laughs> So I mean, there's also what's the other one, Irma or something? Yeah, Irma. Irma yes. Yeah. And then, and then housing, the housing assistance. Well, that's going to help homeowners. Never mind. But the housing assistance fund is going to kick in next month as well. So, um, one more question about use of funds: Do we want to consider arrearages? So, folks are they've been struggling for three months. They're behind three months. They need to bring their you know, in order to stay, they have to um, bring money to the table to stay housed. Is that? Isn't that what we're doing now? I'm, I'm confused. Yeah. That's no, I thought we were sort of going as it's a go forward. So, so I'm talking about folks who have already accrued an arrearage. If that I guess makes you sense. have to look at, is it temporary? 
right it's yeah. in arrears is there something yeah. happening that's going to change their situation right and then that would make sense or maybe they're yeah. they're fixed their situation but they're still still the struggling yeah 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 and, I, and yeah. I'm, I'm throwing that out there because I mean, uh, still struggling to pay back the landlord. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yep. And I'm saying that because the housing assistance fund, which is really for homeowners, if they have um, uh, taken advantage of a forbearance, for example, um, this housing assistance fund will help them bring their mortgage today and and kind of drop the forbearance, if that makes sense. So that's that's what gave me the idea. But I just wanted to throw it out there as a possible use. Um, so any other comments? I think we're, we're, we just need to maybe tighten the screws a little bit, Caitlin, in terms of ex the, exp the, the definitions of what, um, the eligibility is, and then the, um, the backup documentation to prove, right, that Tiffany would need to approve. My dog um, is broken. Uh, <laughs> so I think maybe so by the next meeting, which is December 12th, um, I'll kind of coordinate with Tiffany to kind of get a, you know, revised program guidelines and application, which, which could then be, I guess, put on their website, like we had the emergency program now, um, as well as, um, you know, and then run it by you all. And then yeah. also, I guess, the MOU with the Pettengill House, too. And have that all yeah. drafted up before the December 12th meeting. Does that sound that's, good? And I guess the list, the eligibility is what's really going to be expanded, I think. The list, right. I think, that Pettengill will look at to see who really is going to qualify for this, you know, rental assistance. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? This is December 12th, right? That doesn't sound right. Yes. Yep. De December 12th? December, December? Oh, no, sorry. December 2nd. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's our regular meeting. Yeah. Okay. And can I just ask? I just want to make sure that there, there, the funds wouldn't be restricted um, for like public housing or the um, James Mill. You because know, we do have, you know, sometimes their names come up and there are, there is sometimes first month's rent that's required. And if it's kind of the middle of the month or they don't have, if they're on fixed incomes and their social security hasn't come in, um, it's, that it that is included like there's no um with this funding that it's public housing is not excluded or like the usda at james d miller i i again i'm going back to income eligible um i'm trying not to be project focused here but what does everyone else think is there are there other um Mechanisms. Your question, Tiffany, um, would the funds be eligible for housing that is, you know, affordable housing? If housing, uh, the housing authority or, or um, James D. Mill, those right, properties. They're, they're, um, right, their they're rent is based on their income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, there, but, if, if you're living in public housing and your income goes down, doesn't your rent go down to match yes. it? Correct. I'm just saying like a move in. Oh, 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 I see. Like to help move in because sometimes it is required. And if if say it's the middle of the month and it's it's prorated or um, again, there's moving costs and they're paying that, but they need help getting moved into the home. I just want to know like up front if that would qualify as well. I don't think that should be excluded. I, I think it's yeah, like, I don't Suzanne, like you I said, don't it's income based. So as long as they're under the income, I, I think right. they can apply. As long as yeah. I meet the other eligibility criteria. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I noticed in the um, Malden program or the Melrose program uh, that rent cannot exceed 50% of the household's income. Oh, yeah, that was interesting. So they, you know, they look at what is the lease, you know, what's the monthly amount, and, you know, is this realistic? Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to make sense to me as well. Yeah. Although if something is, um, if they go, they they may have a current situation where that was the case, and then the in, the rent is increased, and they need a couple of months to make that transition to a, you know, another town or a different property ever. So. Yeah. I don't want to put that necessarily. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about that. 
But if it's over 50%, it's really not sustainable, right? Not sustainable. right. Exactly. Unless we can foresee they're going to change in some way. Um, I, I don't think you don't like want to encourage. The, yeah. I like putting the 50% because first of all, it's not, it's realistic. It's not like 30%, which, you know, just doesn't work for people. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, mm -hmm. I think the more criteria, the less room there is for being accused of subjectivity. Right. So I think if you've got the 50%, it doesn't mean an exception can't be made, you mm -hmm. know, under some unusual circumstances, but I like putting a parameter in place. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Suzanne? Yes, I think Madeline was was referencing another program that had a um, an eligibility criteria or a restriction. So regarding people, you know, that only people who would be eligible would be people moving from Newburyport to Newburyport. Um, and I I would suggest that you not adopt that type of a restriction, but rather just tie it to people moving into Newburyport. Otherwise, you may get into fair housing issues. Yeah. yeah. It was John. It was a priority for um, you know Malden residents. Um, yeah. But I agree with you. I I think we. I I would not be encouraging that. I feel like, you know, we want to be as welcoming as we can be. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Good. I'm being in the interest of time. How are we feeling about? So, Caitlin, you have everything you need to. Put pen, put pen to paper. I do. I feel like I do. Um, I feel okay. like I can get a good draft going. Um, okay. Checking in with Tiffany, um, and then perhaps join you and Madeline. And I think we'll have something ready for the December twelfth meeting. Wonderful. December second. December second. <laughs> I did say that. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening on the twelfth? But <laughs> uh, okay. Can you please pull up the um, the rehab program for us? I just want to move into this one quickly because I'm not. I, I, yeah, I'm I don't not have the actual like website, but I have the little the, the, um, the write up that I um, yeah. just provided you all. Yeah, right here. Okay, great. This is basically from the website itself. Right. Okay. So again, I think um, did, did everyone have a chance to read through um, the housing rehab program? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. For me, uh, there are a couple things here. Um, one, we need to make, let this, you know, make sure people know that this is available. Um, number two, I'm wondering about the contractor. Um, it seems kind of onerous. Like, is there a way for us to um, have them bring, you know, just in, like, does the contractor have to, um, I, I don't know if you um, if you can click on that. See here, the contractor information form. You said that there were not many contractors who wanted to um, sign up, for example, in your in your um, write up. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So too many um, steps, right? So Yes, yeah, so I guess the background is this, um, is that the CPC City Council appropriated 30000 to this program, you know, a while back, back in um, fiscal year 2016. No funds have been spent um, for this program um, since that new um, allocation. Um, you know, there are long-time program manager reports that there's it's not an issue with the rules and guidelines, but more to get contractors that would kind of buy into this program and sign on. Um, and so I think she's going to kind of re-up her efforts to get the word out there um, regarding um, this program. Um, and I guess the question is, is there ways, which are, I think, I'm pretty sure she said the rules and guidelines are set by the state, but mm -hmm. is there any way we can kind of get the word out more about this program, get these funds used, um, you know, to make it a more attractive program and for the contractors to get involved? And I guess we're just joined by, just so you know, um, Director Port has just signed into the meeting. Hello, Director Port. Hey folks, sorry, I'm between Welcome. Me. It's okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah, so this, so, so, so yeah, so I guess, and, it, and I didn't even realize that there was, there was a, a contractor um, piece to this. And you say, is that, is that for sure that is the state really dictating that, that policy, or is this something that we can play with a little bit? 
Um, from the program manager reporting, that is the state that kind of dictates this, this program, the rules and guidelines, um, whether we want to add a component to it, um, you know, we can propose it to her and she can, I guess, double back to whoever her contact is at the state and see if it can be incorporated um, to perhaps, I guess, you know, breathe some new life into the program and get some people um, interested. Because like I said, there's been no funds used um, for several years, but the program still exists. It does make you wonder. I mean, contractors in the city have no trouble getting lots and lots of work, right? I mean, the issue is more people who want contractors can't get them. So why would anybody go through an onerous process if that's what it is to, to sign up for this? That's what I'm Well, and say. also, I'm wondering if the onerous process was when this program was funded with CDBG funds, you know, and then the state would have rules. I mean, if we're funding this with CPA money, I don't think the CPA... A, program funds regulate this. I think that's a throwback yeah. to federally funded housing rehab programs, which the city used to administer, you know, quite successfully. Yeah. And, and a lot of those units are on our subsidized housing inventory. That's where all those single family homes in the SHI are, are from the housing rehab program. It was administered for many years and, you know, is very you know, goes back for many years in many communities. So I'm wondering if this could be more loose, but I, I think Karen's right that it's probably just, it's really hard to find contractors to do small jobs. It's, imp and it's if there's impossible. there's extra layer of paperwork, <laughs> you forget impossible. about it. Yeah. Karen, you're right. There's so much work in this town. People yeah. cannot get contractors and a $7,500 limit basically eliminates all of them. They're not going to do a $7,500. If you want to modify and make a bathroom handicapped accessible, it's probably going to be more than that. And, and that's, it, it's very hard um, in, in, in this community right now compared to what it was years ago where $7,500 would get you a lot of work. Today it won't. And they just are not interested. It's... Um, I live but it, that's not the whole project, right? The 7,500 could be no, toward, toward that's just, something. That's just something to, amount to bring to things exist. up to code, to insulate, to make it greener, uh, put in some new windows. You know, you, you shouldn't do that. But these guys are just berserk with business. It's, <laughs> you know, it's true. And it's just, you'll talk, I've talked to a lot of them and, and they just, They've got a list of people that is a long list and they have to prioritize and they have to go where the money is. That's a problem. So, so a couple of things to think about um, here and we might not get through this one because I'm, I'm conscious of time and I don't want to keep you past an hour. Would, could we potentially consider doubling this grant amount? I would think that'd be a smart idea to start. Okay. Okay, and and I realize that only gets us two grants, but let, at least we can test the waters, right, to see if there's any takers. It makes it a little more, um, kind of brings it to uh, current day prices. <laughs> and then, um, and then um, so that's number one. Number two, um, can we please look at the onerous process and try to simplify that and make that more streamlined so that it's easier for a homeowner to take advantage of this and say, maybe they have a contractor, maybe, you know, that, you know, that they already have somebody in mind um, that doesn't, but doesn't have the time or the desire to go through all this process. Um, number three, um, I would like to just add, uh, you know, the, uh, not just a clear need for correcting code violations, but um, a demonstrated need for energy efficiency um, and we can you know whether it's windows insulation um, you know I, I need to look up you know what what those definitions could be but um, I, I would like to us to start at least starting to a little bit focus on you know the, the that that piece of the rehab um, need so I, I, you know, with a with a eye toward keeping energy um, costs down. So, yeah, and you know, National Grid has that program where they come into the house and assess, which right. would be helpful to get yep. that, that assessment if we're looking at the green piece. Yep. No, that's a great point. Good point. 
yeah. Massé, is that what it's called? I think so. Yeah, Massé, yeah. yeah. Not to be confused with Mass Saves. <laughs> Everything sounds the same. <laughs> um, but in the past, Suzanne, and, and this may have changed because I've been out of the field now for many years, there was, Mass Save would come in and say, you know, here's X number of light bulbs, here's X number of this, but to energy, you know, to do all these things, it's gonna cost this much money and then people wouldn't have it. Um, so to be able to tie this type of a program to Mass Save and then implement the, the projects that Mass Save recommends mm -hmm. might be a good way to get these funds out and used. Yep, no, I yeah, think it's a great point, yeah. I think they, they give you a discounted price too on certain things. They, discounted, they, right. Yeah. It's already discounted. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe this now, I mean, and I know we have fun sitting there and we have to, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's okay to pivot um, according to what was appropriated back in FY16. So that's another question. Um, I think, I think, Suzanne, you, you bring up some really great ways to enhance this program. I think the way to do it would be um, to, you know, return these funds to the CPA grants and then apply again with a revised kind of scope and, and mission and, and kind of process, um, you know, in conjunction with the, you know, existing program manager. I think that would be a great way to kind of maybe apply the, for this upcoming grant cycle. So there's no, you know, so there's overlap between the existing program and the, and the new program. Okay. How does everyone feel about that? Fine. Sounds good. Uh, Okay, yeah. good. No, I'm excited about this. I think there's um, that we have this has a lot of potential. I'm sorry, I cut you off, whoever that was. I can't say. I was going to say, my only concern, <laughs> I guess, is that um, what Madeline was saying earlier was that it sounds like it's not CPA. I guess it would be helpful, Caitlin, if you can find out if there is an onerous application process for, um, for the contractors or if we're just assuming that um it sounds like there. there really is from the program manager and she identified that as like the oh, main okay. barrier of oh, why people oh, okay. are interested but yeah. that doesn't mean there's not ways to simplify it you know this program it's old program you know it's yeah. back since 1992 so maybe um it could use some refining um, well yeah look and, into that yeah and caitlin if it is coming in you know, if it's being funded through cpa but you know built on the you know, sort of the old format of fun, something funded through federal funds, you know, there may be a new opportunity for some more flexibility. I mean, mm -hmm. we still yeah. want, um, you know, well-qualified um, contractors that have liability insurance, right? Um, but maybe it doesn't have to be quite as onerous. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think that's a, that's a great point. And I, um, you know, it might be interesting to we have a representative from Mass Save. Just you know, I don't know if that's an internal meeting or something that we can investigate and figure out the best way to tie them in. Um, all right, we are at six fifty nine. People, wow. <laughs> Suzanne, you run wow. a tight ship. I love I it. Do. <laughs> I do. I have. I. I. That's my commitment to you, and I appreciate you Good all job. being here and taking the time. <laughs> Out of your busy days, and um, so um, thank you all. Um, thanks for sharing your ice cream flavors. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Caitlin, for um, keeping us um, doing all the back back room work. We really appreciate that. Yeah, your and staff report was very helpful. It yes. was very helpful. Yeah, thank oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. And so, with that. Um, I will adjourn our meeting, and I guess we will see each other again on December 2nd. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.